Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Inclusive Education Showcase as part of Diversity Fest 2020. My name is Terry Cumming, and I am the Academic Lead Education for the Disability Innovation Institute, and I am also a fellow of the Scientia Education Academy. We'd like to get started today with a welcome to country from Auntie Maxine Ryan from La Perouse Local Aboriginal Land Council. Welcome everybody. My name is Auntie Maxine Ryan and I'm from the La Perouse Aboriginal community of Botany Bay and I belong to the Darwin people. I would like to acknowledge the Bidjigal and the Gadjigal clan, the land we stand on today. And I would like to acknowledge my elders past and present and I would like to welcome you all here today. The Kensington area of Sydney is significant to my Aboriginal community and my ancestors. Not too far from here during the construction of the new part of the hospital, there was, there was a fireplace that was discovered. And with that discovery, with modern day technology, it come out to be 6,000 years ago, which is significant in testing these things as my people have been in Australia on the land for 6,000 years ago. And my people would care for the land and water within the country in close connections to the environment. On behalf of the La Perouse Local Aboriginal Land Council and my ancestors, I welcome you here today and I hope that you respect this land as my people have since the beginning of time. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Auntie Maxine. Um, just some quick housekeeping before we get started today. If anyone's having difficulty and cannot use the chat function at the top of the YouTube screen, please email the Disability Innovation Institute at diiu at unsw.edu.au. And if it's really an emergency, we have a phone number you can call if that doesn't work. But there is somebody on the email checking. Please see the closed caption button at the far right bottom of the YouTube frame. You can turn this on and off as necessary. The audience Q&A is via YouTube live top chat on a web browser. It's at the top right hand corner on a mobile device. It's directly under the video. And if you post your questions, they'll be passed on to the presenters after every presenter is done. We'll have a question and answer period. So in order to not waste any time, I am going to go ahead and introduce our first presenter, Nicole Santelin. Thanks, Terry. Um, first place, slide, please. Thanks. Um, I'm Nicole. I research student experience and online education. This year, I've been involved with piloting the Scandinavian assessment platform, Inspira. One of my tasks was to run an accessibility audit on the platform. We found that Inspira met all the WCAG AA criteria, so we gave it a gold star for accessibility. With that hurdle passed, our team set about designing a demo assessment. The intention was not to build something accessible, it was to build something fabulous. When it was finished, I once again turned on my screen reader and was shocked to find that I couldn't even get through one question. This leads me to my most salient point, which is that software and platforms such as Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Moodle Quiz and Inspira are all authoring tools. Authoring tools are subject to anti-discrimination laws. So out of the box, they're all accessible. However, what students encounter is not software out of the box. It's what their lecturer chooses to do with the software. So today I'll be talking about online assessment and I've chosen 10 really easy things that can be done to help accessibility. Tip number one, 
Although some assessment platforms have inbuilt accessibility features, they are usually fairly limited. For example, Inspira has a text reader, but you can't use a text reader if you have a vision impairment. Instead, you'd need a screen reader, and there are at least six of those on the market. Therefore, the best practice is to allow students to use their own computer with compatible assistive technology. They will have experimented with a range of technology and will have spent many hours learning to use it. Failure to allow this is failure to provide equal access. Tip number two, avoid browser lockdown. Browser lockdown software such as Safe Exam Browser stops students from accessing documents, software or the internet during online assessments. Unfortunately, it also stops students accessing assistive technology. You wouldn't tell a student in a wheelchair they can't bring their chair into an examination hall, so you shouldn't block access to assistive technology in a digital exam. Tip number three, give access in advance. Assistive technologies behave differently in different environments, so students do need a trial run. They will need to test keyboard shortcuts or voice commands for various question types and familiarise themselves with navigation. In fact, all students would benefit from this. As students tell us, it's the fear of the unknown that creates the most stress in digital assessments. Tip number four, provide suitable image alternatives. On this slide, there's an image of a student staring at a computer. She has a frustrated, stressed look on her face. I put the image there because there was a lot of text on this slide and I wanted to balance it out with an image. We often get told that images need alternative texts, but this isn't true. Only important images need them. It takes a fraction of a second to access this image visually, but it takes quite a few seconds to access it through a screen reader. If the image is unimportant, we're wasting the student's time. It's better to go to the alt text editor and mark the image as decorative. This way, the screen reader will skip over it and the student can spend more time with the resources that really matter. Next slide, please. Tip number five, provide a resource that can receive screen focus. Although these two tables look the same, a screen reader would read them very differently. This is because table one is an image of a table, but table two is actually a table. For example, it's not possible to edit table one, but I could click into table two and change the data. If a screen reader finds an image of a table, it will search for an alt text. If no alt text has been written, many programs will auto-generate one. This is not appropriate for an assessment. Be considerate when using image files such as JPEG or TIFF. You should be able to pro provide this information in an alternative form, such as a written description or an informative alt text. Next slide, please. Tip number six, be careful when using colour. In Australia, approximately one in 12 men have a colour vision deficiency. There are many websites that can suggest colourblind friendly palettes, or it is sometimes possible to use words or texture to show this type of information. Colour contrast is also important. Very low contrast can make the contents of a page difficult to see. The message here is that we're all quite unique in what we see. Next slide, please. Tip number seven, choose question types carefully. Although an authoring platform may be accessible, not all of the question types are. For example, some highly visual question types such as hotspot and drag and drop are not. Use these question types with caution. If there's absolutely no other way to design the question, then you'll have to use it. However, the drag and drop question shown here is an example of what not to do. The problem is that it's repetitive, which wastes time and it may contribute to a student's chronic pain. It could also 
have been built as a multiple choice question. For example, banana peel and paper go in the A, trash, B, treasure chest, or C, compost bin. The take home message here is that all these question types are fun for a person who, fun, all these question types are fun, but not for a person who uses assistive technology. Next slide, please. One of the most exciting things about digital assessment is that it offers the opportunity to use post paper resources. But let's think about how these resources can create barriers for some students. For a start, videos and audio files need closed captions or transcriptions. This can be easily achieved by loading the resource into YouTube. I often hear academics say they're not prepared to do this because they don't trust the privacy settings. But I'd like to point out that for two years, I've been trying to get the box and Echo 360 lecture videos to be accessible to screen readers. I've had no success with this. In contrast, YouTube's video player is accessible, the closed captions are easy to use, and students regularly tell us that they appreciate the playback options. Sometimes accessibility features such as these help a wide range of students. This is part of UDL theory, which recognises that where appropriate, students appreciate having access to resources in a variety of forms. Tip number nine, when using links, avoid text such as click here or just pasting in long URLs. Give your links appropriate short names in hypertext. This is because people who use assistive technology often navigate by listing the link titles. It's also helpful if the navigation is consistent. It's quite easy to get lost or not know how to return to the previous page if you do not know if the new page has opened in the same window or a new one. And tip number 10, sensitive language. Try to avoid phrases like, in the next column, you will see a link. Instead, rephrase to, in the next column, there is a link. I'm sure if you asked a person with a visual impairment if this is important, they'd think it was hilarious. I say this not for that person, but instead for you. It is important to think about inclusive language, so you do not feel like you've accidentally said the wrong thing next time you work with someone who uses assistive technology. So that's 10 tips in 10 minutes. So I'll pass over to the next presenter. Good afternoon, everyone. The activity I'm about to describe has its basis in three overarching questions. And these questions are, what fosters a supportive learning community? Now there's many answers to that, but one of them is, how can personal strengths be meaningfully recognized and celebrated so everyone feels seen and heard and valued in their classroom? And related to that, what are some critical ingredients for students having a positive impact on others and thereby contributing to the development of a supportive learning community. The context of the activity I'm about to describe is a class called Executive Blueprint, which starts students on their AGSM Executive MBA journey. It includes topics such as communication, peer coaching, ethics, and being in learning mode, all aimed at helping students really thrive throughout and beyond their MBA. The students are working professionals and managers, I should say, uh, with a mean age of about 30. And the activity happens at the end of an intensive three day residential. Now, an important um, implication of that context is most classes don't happen at the end of such an intense immersive experience. So the question that I invite you to consider as you dis uh, hear about the activity I'm gonna describe is, how might you adapt it to suit your teaching context, where students haven't spent about 28 of the last uh, 72 hours really together. Okay, so it begins by asking students to brainstorm. What is some written appreciative feedback? Uh, what makes some written appreciative feedback particularly positively impactful? So they brainstorm alone 
and then in pairs, and then I capture on the board some of their answers to this question. And these answers that they come up with tend to be things like, well, it's particularly impactful if it's specific, if it's thoughtful, personalized, timely, tailored, detailed, authentic, or incident-based. So different groups come up with different answers to this question, but there's some typical ones. After capturing these, I then announce, later we're gonna do some action research to see which of these truly matters most. I then announce that they're going to give anonymous appreciative feedback to six of their class colleagues by completing for each of them a I most valued form. That form looks like this. So students can write, dear, and then the name of the person they're giving feedback to, what I most valued about you and your contributions to our learning is how you, and then they complete um, that uh, statement. Uh, uh, with as much rich detail as possible in accordance with the ideas we captured on the previous slide. So each student receives a package of six of these um, forms and completes one form for each of six students. Now, a potential issue with this activity is maybe some students don't get many or even any forms. So the way I take care of that is, I organize students in a large circle in groups of three. And the idea is, that you will provide students to the three students in the group to your left and any other three in the class who you think most deserve or you'd really like to write to. So to be concrete about this, uh, we can see in the slide here, Sam, Kelly and Pradeep in the top left hand corner will write feedback to Michael, Susie and Sarah and any other three in the class. In turn, Michael, Susie and Sarah will write feedback to Terry, Joe, and Jimmy, and any other three students in the class, and so on. So they have 12 minutes to do this. So just two minutes per piece of feedback. And I really underscore there's a lot of, the time goes fast, there's a lot you might wanna say. So I encourage you to really take a deep breath and think about how you can invest these 12 minutes really well, because as you're gonna see, it truly matters. So, the feedback distribution process starts three minutes, uh, so nine minutes into the feedback giving or three minutes before they finish. I collect up each of the nameplates which are in front of each student, and then I lay them out alphabetically, often along the hallway just outside the room. Uh, but the, the main principle is, I don't want students to know who has given them this anonymous feedback. So who has and who hasn't. So uh, wherever logistics allow, uh, I lay that out, which kind of uh, makes it a bit more anonymous. At the 12 minute mark, I then ask students, often just give a, a few moments just to finish up their last one, to please stop writing, take the staple out of their package of six sheets of paper, organize them alphabetically, and then two groups at a time, again, organized so people don't see the people who are writing to them, so it makes it a bit more anonymous. Um, they walk along the line where I put the name tags alphabetically and they distribute face down the six sheets of anonymous feedback that they've just provided. I then, when they're all distributed, ask students to please collect the feedback and the name tag, um, the feedback provided to them and their name tag, read through each of the sheets of feedback, and then identify the piece of feedback that was most positively impactful on them. I then have them each go around in a circle and stand before proudly reading out to the class what someone said to them. And they read the whole form. Dear Max, what I most appreciated about you and your contributions to our class are, and then whatever the anonymous person has said about Max. At the end of doing this, each person then says, receiving that appreciative feedback makes me feel, and then identifies one or two, as authentically as they can, the feelings that they had. Maybe they're surprised or invigorated or exhilarated or confirmed or confused or appreciated or whatever it is. Uh, but the rationale for doing this is that when positive emotions are labeled, they're savored much more richly. 
And the whole point of this is when they're reading this, as I'm saying, the whole class will be listening, but the prime audience is you. So you can hear the wonderful things about you that your colleagues have recognized and really internalize them. And then to further enhance this internalization, there's a rowdy applause after each report. And at this moment, uh, students just relish soaking up uh, what's being shared about them. It's just wonderful. Sometimes tears are shed and there's always a rich sense of appreciation and respect in the room. After relishing that moment for a while, we then have a fairly distinct shift of gears by checking in that everyone is aware of the nature of rhetorical questions. They don't need to be asked aloud. They're just something to think about. And then here are the rhetorical questions. How many of the pieces of feedback you wrote were read out aloud by a colleague? Now, I suspect that more than half of the class, because some people's will be read two or three times, more than half of the class will have an answer to that question, which is no, which is quite sobering about the related question. What does that imply about the positive impactfulness of the feedback you provided? Now, this is not something to be sad about if it wasn't read, but it's definitely information which presents a learning opportunity. How can you give feedback in a way that will more positively impact other people? So in other words, how could it be improved? To answer that question, we return to our action learning exercise. And what I do is have each student identify which of these things they think was the clearest theme in the feedback that everyone chose to read out. And I say, you've just got to pick one theme. And so please, uh, raise your hand when I call out the, the one thing that you thought predominated. And here would be some typical numbers. Uh, timely, zero. Uh, uh, personalized, nine people raise their hand. Uh, specific, 11. I'm sorry, this uh, format's got jumbled up here. Thoughtful, six. Uh, tailored, five. Authentic, seven. Incident-based, eight. Detailed, two. So what we can conclude from this is the highest numbers came up for specific, personalized, and incident-based. It suggested if you really want to positively impact people, you want the feedback you give them to have these characteristics of being specific, personalized, and incident-based. So then the next steps we have are to think about to support us, have a to nurture a supportive learning community. Uh, there's three questions here: What value-adding strengths of yours were highlighted by the feedback you received? And in what context could you apply them more often or more extensively? What opportunities will you take to increase your positive impact on others? Now, from the examples of other people's positive impact that was read out, think about those you admire. Think about, you say, I, I wish I did that or I did that a little bit more. You can do that a little bit more if you make a goal of it. So set that goal. And then finally, what opportunities will you take to increase the positive impactfulness of your feedback? So I have students uh, answer each of those three questions. And then we conclude by them standing and sharing with the class their response to just one of those questions. And that is their commitment to help build the learning community of the class uh, by more richly recognizing, celebrating, and thereby helping to bring out the best in their class colleagues. It's truly inspiring to see people fervently commit to this kind of goal. And that's my exercise. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me fine. Uh, my name is Dow with a very long last name here, as you can see. Um, let me just go here and try to advance to the next slide. There we go. OK, so I am a lecturer over at um, at the School of Social Sciences. And today what I'm going to do is just briefly let me put my timer on. There we go to talk to you briefly about an experience that um, I've, it, it sort of evolved over the, the past two years, but I really decided to make something different for this term. But essentially what my focus is, is really paying attention to well-being and mental health, in the case, student well-being and mental health. And there's a couple of ways in which 
everyone can do this. Now, one of the ways when we're looking into well-being is to do some of the things that probably most of you already do, which is in curricular learning, supportive environments, self-managing capacity building, supporting uh, well-being campaigns. And then one of the things that I did to sort of contribute to this area was I've created um, and introduced on my Moodle, basically a section, my name is Deborah, so it's Dr. D, so it's Dr. D's Life Lessons. And basically there, I'm always adding um, interesting articles that have to do with uh, procrastination, mental health, uh, managing time, with the student experience, or how do you find ways to better, um, I don't know, deal with university life. So. It's more about just giving stuff that it's just really interesting reads um, and really encouraging students to, to go in there to send you stuff. And I found that to be it's sort of passive because it's there on Moodle. But once you look at the numbers, you always see that students are kind of going in. So that I've found to be quite helpful. And when it comes to mental health, which is an area that I'm really particularly um, focused on, it, it has to do with us, with the educators being trained and in, in awareness for the practical side of how things work and also supporting, you know, awareness, help seeking campaigns. But what I've tried to do also in this space, and I mean, obviously, I'm not the only one, but this is just to show at least my experience, which has been sharing my personal experience with mental health. Now, just to put it in the context of a, a, a pedagogical structure, this would fit here, and I thank uh, Terry Cummings for this, which I really liked, where you have here um, provide multiple means of engagement here through self-regulation, and it's, may, might be hard to see, but this idea of facilitating um, coping and giving students mechanisms. So with this, there is one single message if from my short time, basically the idea that vulnerability is an act of courage for us educators to be vulnerable to our students is something that at least from my experience, it has been, I, I think students in general have taken this as an extremely positive experience. And there's many ways in which you can do this. So I'm just going to share a little bit of what I did. So in my case, this has to do really about talk. So for me, I've been dealing with, I started with issues with depression and anxiety in my early 20s when I was in university. I'm doing relatively fine, I guess, um, you know, some two decades later. But a lot of people that are starting going through this, and it is in your late teens and early 20s, which is exactly the same time students are at um, university, that most people begin to develop or have sort of their first um, of more, um, something that is a bit more than just a normal stress, right? Something that is really affecting all aspects of life. However, because it is, so hidden. This is the sense that a lot of people have. This is the sense that you get just from so many students to say, everybody got everything together and I'm the only one who hasn't, I'm the one who's worried, I'm the one who's concerned. So I think the moment you open up, you give also this opportunity to say, look, you're not alone. It's not just you. Because one of the issues that comes with mental health is that, um, and I really like, uh, I, I love Gemma Carell. She, I follow her on, on Instagram. She has these great series. Um, and this one is great, right, on what mental illness feels like. It's like, why don't you just try harder? And it's, that's not how it works. But one of the problems with a lot of um, illnesses or conditions that are, let's say, invisible, um, especially when it's something that has to do with the brain. I mean, as if the brain was, you know, not part of your body was something, you know, super different. But this is really about breaking this sort of stigma and being able to, to share and say, look, it shouldn't be a big deal. It shouldn't be something that you are um, afraid to share or that you're embarrassed of, you know, to share. So also another thing, and this is something that I've found good to get even from other colleagues and to be able to debate things like this, like imposter syndrome, um, or to be able to talk about. So even if you're not, you know, if you don't want to expose yourself too much because maybe you're not there yet, 
you can talk about students about moments, that, you know, maybe you deal with overthinking, maybe procrastination, or you have had serious problems, or how, how do you find, what is your solution? Or how have you better found a way um, to, to deal with this? It can be with failure, it can be with uh, frustration. So this is really the message that I wanna send is just, I think we should try to, it's not just educating on a subject, but we have just this marvelous opportunity with our students to also be able to give them life skills and really be sort of, you know, the elders and say, look, I've been where you are and this is what helped me get to the next phase. So if anything, there you have it, the message vulnerability is an act of courage. So be courageous. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining all of us this afternoon. Um, it's certainly novel to be presenting online, and I'd wish my Auslan interpreter luck because I speak quickly, so apologies already. Okay, so next slide, please. Uh, today I'd like to basically give you a into... banana, zimil, uns quadradinhos de... Sue, you're muted. I know. Somebody muted me. There you go. All right. So what I wanted to basically uh, talk to you today was how you can use some pre-existing uh, live presentation software, which is called Zetings, and you can play around with how you can use that in combination with uh, Teams. Um, I also use it with Blackboard Collaborate as well as with Zoom. But today I'm going to show you some ideas of how you can inter use that with Teams because Teams does something which the other two platforms don't do, and that is that it closed captions. So therefore it makes it more inclusive for you. Next slide. Okay, so the, my presentation is going to follow the, the following structure. Um, I'm always a person who likes to give you an, in, an overview, so that's what I'm hoping to cover. Um, just note that the Q&A will be at the end of the whole entire presentation today. Next slide, please. All right, so what is Zetings? Um, some of you may well have already found Zetings, and if you haven't, I really encourage you to go and check this amazing free software out. Um, for educators, the really cool thing is that this is free. And we get a free account as we're educators, and that gives us the capacity to have up to 500 attendees to any of our live presentations. So while I'm lecturing to my large undergraduate cohort, and you can also do this with smaller postgrad classes as well, I will present live time using Zetings. And my students will use their devices because they're gonna use their devices anyway, and I'd rather them use it to interact with me in real time and space. And certainly this year when we had um, had to move to online very, very quickly, it provided me with the opportunity and my students to feel connected. So I thought that was quite cool. The other really nice thing about Zetings is that for your free account, you get a whole lot of really cool analytics in there that help you understand how your students are responding to the various things that you're putting out there. So I'd encourage you all to sign up for free. Next slide. All right, so student engagement is really huge. And we know that this is something that we need to be really, really mindful of when we're presenting to our students. Uh, one thing which I really love is the ability to drop YouTube clips in there. And the fantastic thing about it is that Zetings is going to chop off that first five, 15 seconds worth of ads that you often get forced upon you within the world of YouTube. So the beautiful thing is you select that YouTube clip and you drop it into your Zettings presentation and it will snip off that wonderful piece of advertising at the front and just start from the very start of your clip. So super, and it couldn't be simpler. You'll be amazed at how simple this is. Next slide. The other really cool thing is, is that you have six free options of how you can engage with your students in lifetime polls. Um, simple things like thumbs up, thumbs down, multiple choice, rating stars and some sort of like a Likert type scale. You've got a rank order um, as well as a free text and the word cloud. Um, and all of these are super intuitive to use. 
And, you know, I urge you to give this a go. And literally, I think you can be up and running um, and being, you know, pretty proficient in Zedings in less than an hour. Next slide. Okay, so what other student engagement tools does it have? It has something called an activity wall. And my screenshot there has a picture, obviously, of my Zetings, uh, but it's got the activity wall there. And when I click on that bubble, it allows me to see what my students are typing in there. And it gives them that wonderful option to be able to ask you questions during your lecture. And you would be able to see under that little bubble, there will be numbers that pop up that show you that you have students asking you questions. And you're able to have a look at that and then project them onto the large screen. Um, so it allows that real-time activity that goes beyond those quick polling type questions. So a more sort of extended um, question and response thing can happen in that space. Next slide. Okay, so here's the interesting thing about how you run all these things together. And look, this did take some trial and error when I was trying to work out how do I use things with Teams, Zoom, Blackboard Collaborate. So it's pretty standard regardless of which of these platforms you want to interact with. So when you log into your Zetings account, um, you select your save presentation and then you hit the present button. And you'll be able to tell that that's working because the timer will start as well. So then what you're doing is you're switching your browser over to your Teams page to start your team presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so nice and simple. You're then going to share your content when you're in that team space. And you're going to look for the window where it's actually showing your Zetings presentation. And you're going to select that one. Next slide. Really important, as we all know, when we're teaching online, we want to record these presentations as well. So always make sure that you go in, um, you switch on recording, but also really important for that inclusive piece is make sure that you turn on your live captions, your closed captioning that goes on. I'd love to be able to tell you that you're going to get perfect um, closed captioning. You're not necessarily, but it's going to be reasonable, okay? Reasonable quality. And if you speak a little bit more slowly and clearly and also practice that as well, it can help how well it actually closed captions what you're saying. So that's the really nice inclusive piece. That Teams has the advantage over perhaps Zoom or Blackboard Collaborate. So something to keep in mind. Okay, so next slide, thank you. The other really important thing that you do is that you guide your students into how on earth do they interact with you in this space? Where do they need to be? So what I've done in the past is made sure that my students have directions within Moodle, uh, both as little information under the little, little connection icon that they can see. Um, of course, announcements are a really good thing that you can use. Um, a whole variety of things, but also within both the Teams chat space as well as your seating space, make sure you've got instructions so that they know what to do. Okay, next slide. All right, so if you actually want to learn more about Zetings, um, I really encourage you to go and have a look uh, certainly have a look at their website, but they've also got some really uh, nice YouTube clips. They've got their own YouTube channel. And if you really want uh, extra support in how to make these things work, these YouTube clips are really fantastic as instructions. So I certainly would encourage you to look at those. Um, and like I said before, the really beautiful thing about this is that it's so incredibly intuitive. And as somebody who's presenting or an instructor, an educator, uh, literally, if you've already got a pre-existing PowerPoint presentation, you're going to be up and running and ready to do your first Zetings before you know it. And the beautiful thing about it is that from the developers, we have heard that it is screen reader friendly. Okay, so that's the other good part about Zetings as well. Anyway, that's my presentation in a nutshell. I'm sure I've gone way too fast for my um, Auslan interpreter and I apologise for that. But I do hope that you will give Zetings a go and look at how you can play around with various platforms and ones that do improve the accessibility for your students with disability out there. Anyway, thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. 
I am talking today about the Are You OK message. I am a lecturer in the built environment and very passionate about making sure that our students are aware of the support of their mental health as they learn from us at UNSW. So I am an Are You OK Day ambassador and I um, very proudly hosted the the event this year on the 20th of September is uh, the 10th of September is um, the UNSW Disability Champion. But the thing is, once a year is not often enough to ask our students if they're OK. We know that there's a huge amount of pressure for, for everyone and, and this year in particular and, and making sure our students feel supported and cared about is a really critical part of inclusive education. So in terms of how the Are You OK message fits into uh, the Universal Design for Learning Framework. There are, are various parts of the brain, as we know, that need to be uh, connected for, for deep learning to occur, and we need to provide lots of flexibility and options in these different areas of the brain that, that are activated to allow for the broadest possible diversity of, of our student body to feel included. So ways of engaging, multiple means of engagement is where this particular um, initiative comes from that I call the Are You OK Monitor. So it's about really tapping into those expectations and beliefs about oneself that that it's possible to, to achieve and, and to manage and cope with study and be able to reflect on and pause and, and think about whether or not um, on an individual level we are actually coping with our study. So in my um, course, which I teach, one of the courses I teach in ter term one, which is a design studio course, I always include a section called learning support. So I have a part of the Moodle course with lots of different um, readings and links to, to places that students can go to, to seek help. And there's something I call the, the weekly check-in. So every week I ask my students to let me know if they're okay. I do a, a weekly check-in before class and it's a way of ensuring that students who are not okay have an opportunity voluntarily to let me know and ask for extra support. So what this looks like is there's uh, a link provided in Moodle and once the students open this link they're able to see just a short message that explains what it's about. So I very much reinforce that this is voluntary, that they don't need to, to do the, uh, the Are You OK monitor, but that it's a way of just reflecting firstly in themselves and how they're managing, how they're coping, and then seeing whether they um, would like to indicate if they're struggling. And then I have the chance to get back to them and provide some extra support or resources to help them manage. So there, are, I essentially hack into the Moodle attendance tool. Obviously, attendance is not mandatory. That's not what this particular initiative is about. But noticing and being able to track if our students are, are engaging, are participating in class is, is important, I feel, in terms of including students who might be experiencing mental health conditions or might be particularly introverted or just not managing with the pressure of term. So firstly, it's a way of just actually being able to notice if a student's not engaged with class for, for several weeks. And on top of that, not just know whether they've turned up. That's not that useful to know. Within the attendance tool on Moodle, the default is just present or absent. So what I do is go in and change that default and give instead a range of options from, you know, or all good or fine, right through to, um, you know, I'm just, I'm not managing. So there are these five levels. They could be shaped or modified in any way. Um, if, if anyone was thinking of doing this in their course, I've, I've thought about whether they could or should be more broad questions around, you know, are you okay on a, on a mental health level? The thing that I guess I'm also conscious of once we begin to ask our students, are they okay, is whether we have the skills um, to, to respond to that, to that message. So, what I try and do is ask them the question, you know, are you okay this week in your study? So it's not about the quality of their work as in, is your work good? It's about saying, are you coping? Are you managing okay? Students that do express that they're struggling, that's a way of 
initiating that broader conversation where we can start to say, is there stuff, you know, is there something else going on that might be holding you back? Is it a matter of just clarifying information or is there actually something happening in your life um, that might be worth dealing with? And here's a bunch of support numbers and resources that you can reach out to. Around 70% of students seem to, to respond to the monitor in, I've, I've implemented this for three years. Uh, this, this is a snapshot of, of a particular week, week three this year. Uh, so I guess what I noticed, this was the week before an assessment and I do, I do track this each week. And I guess early on in the term, a couple of students indicated that they were struggling and I was able to reach out to them. A little bit later, week seven, you know, some more students indicated that they were struggling. Both weeks were just before an assessment. Um, so whether or not the pressure was building throughout term or students actually just began to feel a bit more comfortable with indicating that they that they weren't managing, um, I guess was what I was digging into and, and being able to offer that extra advice, students responded to really positively. So what I do is I send a, a personal message to those students and I let them know at the start of term that if they indicate that they're struggling or, or not managing that, that I'll reach out to them. It could be an anon anonymous thing but all that would really help me to do is send out an, a generalised message to the cohort with general information on how to, how to cope and how to manage but I already do that. So the idea of this monitor is actually to allow me on an individual level to reach out directly to that person and say, hey, you know, I, you mentioned that, that you're a bit confused, you know, let's, let's chat about it. I reach out firstly by email. Usually that ends up in a, you know, a bit of a dialogue. I offer to have a, a chat on um, now via Teams uh, or before or after class. I just try and figure out if what's, what's holding them back. What is it that is happening at this time? completely on a voluntary basis and certainly with no pressure to disclose any aspect of their life. Um, but just to, just to prompt, just to let them know, I've noticed that they've said something's not quite right and let's try and figure it out. So how do I know if it's working? Well, I guess one of the, one of the things that I find with students who are perhaps experiencing a mental health um, challenge or who are not managing with the pressure of the term. Um, often that seems to result in special consideration applications and extensions because they've perhaps not been able to kind of get going or they're not they're just not really engaging with the tasks out of anxiety or fear or concern, um, perhaps feeling judged by others. Um, our degree design is very visible. You present your work in front of the whole the whole year group often you receive direct feedback it's it's a very um, personal and creative expression of of what you're doing as a designer uh, so I guess one indicator last year was that there were no special consideration applications um, most of the students who were just not quite coping and who had other stuff happening in their life we were able to flag that early enough in term and and, and manage it before any extension was required I can't say the same this year. We know this year is a bit of an anomaly in terms of students being overseas, a whole bunch of other reasons um, that special considerations occur, but there was still that ability for a lot of preemptive and proactive management of students who weren't perhaps on track for where they should have been at that term and had something else happening in their life that was impacting their study. I did a quick, um, for this year, um, I did a quick analysis of the, the my experience comments that came back and the the thing I guess I was really happy about was that students indicated helpful was one of the, the biggest words. So learning the content and becoming a good designer, that's great. Being able to do that in a way where students feel supported, that's really my goal. And to end on, there's um, one comment from a student who indicated that, that she valued, he or she valued, uh, you know, the feedback thing, the check-in idea and being able to receive extra help quite quickly. I know that they, none of them could remember that it was called the Are You OK Monitor, so I'll have to work on my marketing, but that's the uh, summary of the Are You OK Monitor that I've implemented. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name's Reinhardt. I manage the audiovisual services and technologies on campus. 
you may notice I'm in a slightly odd surrounding. This exciting space is called the sand pit. This is where my team, the audiovisual team, conduct research and development, innovation into the exciting new future technology that we can deploy into spaces across UNSW, teaching spaces, meeting spaces, and others. Let me take you for a quick tour. Here we've got the team's room where we developed an innovative wall-mounted way to meet real quick. For those of you who know David Kellerman and his work, this is a Microsoft Surface Hub. We're using and prototyping that for a number of things. We've got some devices here that we're testing. Um, for those of you that might know Catherine Gleason and that name, we've been working with Catherine on developing a brand new design for some of our touch panels. Let me point your attention to this. This is a design principles document. I won't show it to you too closely because it might not be that readable. But one of those is about accessibility. The accessibility piece is about creating acoustic, visually beautiful environments that are ergonomic, they're energy efficient. They can also accommodate our unique community needs. And this includes things like mobility, hearing augmentation, wheelchair access, and other accessibility items. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. My team have been working with a vendor here in Sydney to produce a ambidextrous, variable height, and wheelchair-friendly presenter table for our teaching spaces. With any luck, you should see these in our environment across classrooms on the campus in the next few years. So if you peel out to the other camera, I might be able to actually demonstrate that for some of our audience and show you what that looks like as I move this lectern up and down. This lectern has been designed with wheelchair access in mind so that if you do have a, uh, a specific need at a presenter table in a classroom, or if you are of a different size, different shape, and you need the presenter table to be at a different level. I myself am a six foot five uh, Viking, so I'm gonna need it pretty high, but then other people might need it a little lower. And that's what this lectern uh, of the future, this next gen lectern, will be able to do for our community. And we're very pleased um, that we've been able to develop this for UNSW. That's all I have to present to you today, and I thank you for your time. Good afternoon. I'm Geraldine and my background is in um, inclusive education uh, and I find it very interesting when I'm working with students at university, we are very often looking to towards their their strengths, their abilities and very often when they're at university level, it's not always evident, it's not always visible that some of the things that are getting in the way of them accessing their learning or showing what they know. And so what I'd like to talk um, with you today about is some a couple of strategies that are going to support students uh, with non-apparent disabilities that could impact our learning. Thank you. So I'm going to first of all talk about the types of diagnoses that are common across UNSW and two um, case studies or two diagnoses uh, with suggested strategies that are accessible for us all. So very often we're dealing with students who are able or highly able, and when they have a diagnosis or a, a disability that affects learning, it can inhibit not just their uptake, but like I said, showing what they know. So what kind of diagnoses may we be seeing with our students? So there are the neurodevelopmental disorders such as ADHD or autism, uh, there's physical disability and specific learning disabilities. Those are things like dyslexia or dyscalculia. 
There can be things such as uh, the developmental language disorder. And of course, as we've heard from a couple of the presenters so far, anxiety disorder, depression, things surrounding mental health needs. So our first of all, the first of the two examples I'm going to discuss with you are around ADHD, Attention Deficit and Hyperactivity Disorder. And there are, there are mainly two subtypes that we will be, will be evident um, with the people, students, our students or anybody who have this diagnosis. One is the hyperactivity subtype and one is also the attention deficit subtype. You can get both in, in the one person, but more often than not, we're finding that those with the attention deficit subtype are at university presenting here. But for all of these students, these are the key areas that we do see that they have um, difficulty accessing. So things sometimes like problem solving. And somebody's asked me before, you know, what, what is it about problem solving? If they're clearly, if they're at university and they've passed the grades and they've shown ability to be here, why are they not able to problem solve? And it, it can be simply that uh, somebody I know who has ADHD said, it's, it's like I've got 20 tabs open in my head at one time. And so I can problem solve, but my problem is closing down a lot of those tabs so that I can focus on the one thing. So this of course also leads to things like planning. And when we, our expectation of our undergraduates and postgraduates is that they are able to plan and organize and, and stage out, chunk out their learning and prepare for their assignments and the, the loop, the, the hoops they have to jump through and so um, they, we can see difficulty with focusing and that can be really difficult to see when we are in presenting in an online environment uh, when we do see difficulty focusing that can actually be a very short or no attention uh, it can be forgetfulness and we might see hyperactivity but again these are not always going to be clear in uh, an online environment So we're looking at the two tubs, subtypes, but I would like to focus on two things that I think we can help across the board, across all of our subject areas, and that is around planning and organisation. So with planning and organisation, I think it's very important for us to, when we're presenting text, presenting uh, text, whether it's... Um, through papers and written word, whether it's through PowerPoints, whether it's through things like videos and audios, I think it's really important that there is something additional to support the presentation of that text. Something that takes away a lot of the white noise that can be present with a lot of text. Simple diagrams, for example, mind maps, and keep referring back to the mind map. Having people with ADHD very often see the big picture and then we nut down into the details and they can they can find get lost within the details. So we need to keep going back up to that big picture, the mind map or create things in a tabular format to say this is where we are. Now we're going to go down here and then come back up to that main picture again. So using things like mind maps and they can be quite literally hand drawn. Anything would be uh, better than nothing to help students. The other thing uh, is forgetfulness. So if a student hasn't reached out to you and said, I need support with organization, I need to have mini goals or uh, a, the, and chunking in place, then this is what I do with all of my students anyway. And of course, I have in mind those who are prone to be disorganized or feel forgetful about certain things. So there'll be various ways in which I will do reminders. I will just, do things through the Moodle. I will do things through um, through the announcements, through the collaborate sessions, through direct emails to everybody. Just little remembers, and it doesn't have to be an email. It could be just a visual, like just a friendly reminder and a little bit of text underneath. The other thing I'd like to look at is uh, dyslexia, and dyslexia is uh, it can show. Um, it can show itself in many different ways and it also can be very non-apparent. 
And so with students who have dyslexia, again, they need planning and they need time to digest um, text and the information you're giving them. And it won't just impact literacy and you won't just see it through spelling. You may see task avoidance. You may see working memory. When you're in collaborates or tutorials, you may see working memory. So visual cues can be very, very supportive again for students with dyslexia. So this is how I would work with uh, the students across the whole unit. So I, do, I don't necessarily focus on students who I know have a diagnosis. I will just give this to everybody because some people don't know they have anything happening and they just find things hard work or they may not want to share it with you or with the with the rest of the cohort. And so I just provide um, lots of things. The main things I do, again, are mind mappings, a lot of tabular things and a lot of chunking, chunking not only of the content and the information, but also chunking around the, the planning through the course, what's expected and at which point. Just to build on what um, Sue was saying earlier on, using different platforms, for example, Zetings, using interactive graphs, using um, things like Mentimeter, YouTube, all of these things to support and build upon. And the other thing I'd like to mention here is with, with all of these students, and, and it may be non-apparent, is that high levels of anxiety uh, can can be sitting in the background and anxiety as we know will will interfere with so many parts of our life including things like organization planning coping in general submission and deadlines and, and things like that and so i would be looking at looking at the sites getting the support and putting out i always putting out um information and support requests and saying to people you know if you have an issue with this or if you have any questions and there's no such thing as a a, a, a question that can't be answered there's always a solution somewhere please come to us because if you're thinking of it clearly somebody else will be as well. So activity walls and padlets and polls, if they are anonymous, this can really support because those students who have maladaptive perfectionism or anxiety will not necessarily want to ask some questions. So I always have an anonymous padlet on my course where I ask people to give feedback that is anonymous so that I can address it uh, as we go. And that's all I have time for. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Geraldine, and thank you, everybody. Those um, Your presentations were great. They were fascinating and really made me think about several things I can start to incorporate my own practice. Um, we're going to start taking questions now. And the first one I have is for Reinhardt. Is there a way for you and SW academics to get involved or learn more about the future plans of AV in the future at UNSW in more detail. Oh, he's gone. Okay. <laughs> Here's another one. What support is there in UNSW for learning inclusive methods or developing your own teaching practice? How do presenters develop their innovations? Um, I believe that several of us did our own research on that. Um, before I was an academic, I was a high school teacher and I used UDL in my classroom then. So I was trained through professional learning back in the United States. Um, but we have the benefit of a few things going on here at UNSW. We have a, um, in the teaching gateway, there's a whole page on U universal design for learning that Alanya has put together with the PVCE and there is all kinds of resources and links that you can access. There's even a training module there to help you. Um, Dr. Sue O'Neill, who presented here today, teaches a class on UDL. And that's something else you could access. I'm just looking for other questions. Um, does anybody else want to add to that, Sue or Alanya? 
Terry, I guess I would just add that I, I try and focus on and, and really lean on my own experience as a student way back when. I think reflecting back on how you felt when you're a student can help to create some innovations around how we can teach inclusively if particularly you're a student who perhaps um, was a little bit more introverted or didn't feel as confident in, in participating and engaging. For me, that's where I drive a lot of the motivation for developing teaching methods. And don't go anywhere, Alanya, because somebody also asked if um, there was any issue with misuse or abuse of your Are You OK system. Yeah, thank you for asking. I I haven't had any any negative uh, experiences with it so far. I, I guess the main thing I was cautious of and, and really thought about before implementing it was making sure no one felt pressure to respond, um, that it's entirely voluntary, making sure they're very aware that it will show who they are only for the fact of, and that's only visible to me, not to anyone else in the year. Um, so making sure students are aware of that so I can reach out and check if there's anything I can help them with. And also um, I always check with them first if I can loop in their tutor, if it's something I feel their tutor might be able to help support them with more or if it's something that their tutor would benefit from knowing if there's something happening in their life that might be helpful for them to be aware of but I always check with the student first I guess in terms of the way students might respond I suppose the the worst that can happen is if they're okay and, and they say they're not or vice versa either either way I, I reach out to the student and we just have a have a dialogue um, extra support is what they can receive. I don't offer extensions or, or anything outside of the boundary of, of what would normally be within our class. Thank you so much. Um, the next question Deborah's um, and Sue have both offered to answer and I'm going to go in that order. So Deborah, what have been, what have your experiences moving teaching online been? Um, I have to say, well, I think for everybody can say it's been interesting to use the word very loosely. Um, but I think there are opportunities. I think all of us pretty much realize that um, it's a different space, but we have to find a way to manage it somehow. And I, I, I think it's that's why for really be looking at um, student mental health and well-being, because I mean, just look at all of us, right? All educators, everybody saying, you know, this is insane. This is the weirdest term semester I've ever been in. This is a crazy year. And I think it would be very unfair to not share with students this bigger process. So I think for me, what it made me was even more acutely aware that everybody was growing through, you know, these difficulties and being able to share. And also, I think being able to share things through different means. So what I found in terms of this issue for me of mental health is that I actually made a little video. Like I made it like a 15 minute video and I set students so they could look and then they could look in their own time. And I think it's and it, it I guess it ended up working well and it wasn't awkward that I think maybe in the classroom might be a little bit like, mm, OK, she's you know, that's too much information. So you can just, you know, z turn it off. But once it's a video, you you can actually go and see. And, and I think you can take your time. So, um, yeah, it's been interesting, but I think there are good things. I'm an optimist. So I do think that, you know, out of this madness, there are things that we can take as a positive. Thank you. And Sue? Hi. I think for me, because I was able to transition from that live face-to-face -face, uh, lecture that my students were experiencing and very quickly find that way of using multiple platforms like Blackboard Collaborate and Zetings at the same time, the majority of my students actually joined me like they would, but they were joining me from home. And there was that sense of connectedness that students had, and they were already familiar with Zetings. And they were able to understand that they could see how many of their peers were also online with me. And they were still clicking and engaging and in, engaging in polls and all those activities like we were doing as if we were all sitting in the lecture theatre together. And I know that students really appreciated that sense of that they were still all somehow together and you know, UNSW and, you know, through Zetings was that way that we stayed connected. So I think that was really um, important and it really made that transition easier because students had already experienced Zetings in the real life space. 
So that was something that we continued to kind of use in lectures and using the, the features of Blackboard Collaborate um, and trying other things like um, running cahoots and all sorts of fun things for, for my students to do. And I think that made them feel like, although it was all a bit weird, we were kind of having fun and we were being goofy and way when the lecturer didn't get the tech right, um, you know, hey, we're still laughing at Nana for still getting things wrong. So um, I think that was really important for kids, for you know, my students to feel connected um, to us and UNSW. So live presentation software that's synchronous um, was brilliant for that. Thanks, Sue. And uh, there was a comment made that many of these techniques and points are as relevant to staff as to students, such as for meetings and general mental health. Um, I started using an avatar called Lumi, where if I have my headphones and when I talk, it talks for me. And that's what's on the screen. And it really does help with some of that Zoom burnout, because I think we experience that as much or maybe even more so than our students do, because we've been spending a lot of time online in meetings. Any other questions? How do we do, reduce stigma about asking for additional support? That's a really interesting one because it's really difficult for students, but um, I don't know who wants to speak about this. I can. Okay, Geraldine. Oh, sorry. I, I sort of oh. jump in, but I can say first is tell students that it's okay. And that's one big lesson that, that I sort of learned this year. I'm relatively new to to you know, several, only two years, but it's to say, look, this is to your advantage. And this is why it's actually, I think once you explain and say, look, the advantage of actually looking for this is that it levels the playing field for you. And you have an opportunity to do the work in the way that you want to do it. And I, I think it's also up, to, again, up to us educators to say, look, you should do it and it's not a big deal. There's no problem or fault, you know, if you go in and, and, and actually do this. So I think once you make, um, you tell them the steps, you tell them where to go, what to do, and why it's important for them, why it's good for them. I think there is this big, um, you know, I think that's that's probably like the number one first step. Geraldine? I, I, I use uh, case studies and when I, initially I had to kind of pull together a, a few different ones to make a case study um, to, to show examples of, of how things can be for students from what could be perceived as fairly mild to what could be perceived as more e extreme in needing of support. And so, and that, that it's all okay. And this is where I found the anonymous feedback initially was really helpful because it's just, I'm not saying that is the answer, but it is a first step. And even if some people respond to the anonymous feedback, which I always do, and then I try and build up the confidence, say, please email me. Um, let's have a conversation. So that's that's how I approach it. Thank you. Alanya. I think a couple of really important things are firstly giving enough opportunities to um, for students to be able to ask for that help. Um, I, I guess it's like in a class when you're asking if anyone has any questions. We know that it's probably only the super duper confident ones that will put the hand up and jump in if they've got a question unless you give them the time and the opportunity to ask. So I suppose firstly in whatever format just offering and creating that space where students have a, a time or a moment or a pause to, to reach out for that help. I guess the other thing that I think is really important is in terms of the word stigma around support, there can be that misinterpretation that perhaps equitable learning services or, or CAPS or any of the other services somehow give a, a, a leg up or it makes a, you know, an easy ride for, for students, which is just so fundamentally untrue. And I, I try in my class to, I guess, preemptively approach that and bring up equitable learning services quite early in the course and make sure students are aware that, you know, some of the stuff that's going on in people's lives is pretty challenging and, and really hard and it's just a way of being able to ensure everyone can participate equally. So I think it's not so much only about um, helping to, to change the mindset of the students needing support, but the mindset of the students around them so that that stigma is less um, 
just is not there. And I guess also thirdly, the same as as Deborah has indicated, I, I let my students know that I ask for help. I, I called Better Star, I use support services and I don't think as lecturers we have to be all stoic and make it out like we are fully in control of everything and know everything. I try and have that vulnerability where possible and comfortable um, early on so students have role modelling for asking for help. Thank you. And Peter, you're mute. Peter, unmute. And then one additional thing I'd add is that I aim to pick this up in a broader discussion honouring diversity. So I'm very interested in uh, where people have uh, come from to be in the class. So for example, I um, aim to gently call out and celebrate those whose first language is not English. And say so we have so much to admire about those who are taking on a, a postgraduate study uh, where they may also be taking on uh, you know, polishing a second or third language. Um, and then our students to think about what could be some other differences in the room uh, that we might look to, to to appreciate and celebrate. And and related to that is learning is a process and we all have a different process because we come from a different place. And so some people are going to um, uh, have different processes and need different help with their process. And so I think normalizing it through that way uh, to say there's not something wrong with someone if they have a particular process, it's just we have different ways of learning uh, given the different places we come from. Thank you. Any other questions or comments or do any of the speakers want to add anything before we go? I guess that also has something to do with making it not about additional support, but mainstream. How do we make it mainstream? Yeah, I think like part of what several of our speakers talked about is you, you do make it mainstream. It's just part of your teaching. And I think that is so very important. And that's that whole universal design thing. I just want to say really quickly on my own experience with going online, taking my very favorite course out of all the ones I teach face to face and putting it online was um, a sad thing for me, as I'm sure we were all saddened to a point for going, you know, going online from having that face to face interaction with students. Um, having that UDL framework to help me figure out how to do it and still have it be engaging and enriching really was so much more help than I ever imagined it could be. So I really do recommend people go ahead and access that module and do a little research on it because it really does. There's checklists and everything else just to make sure that you're making your curriculum as accessible as you possibly can. Well, if there isn't anything else, I'm going to thank all of our speakers today. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with everybody. I'm going to thank the participants for coming along and participating and asking questions. And I also would like to thank Sebastian and his team, as well as Mari and Jackie and the Remy from the Scientia, everybody that helped put this together and make it run so smoothly. It's been a great experience. Thanks, everybody.